Давайте. Ее сегодня будет подменять Настя, потому что это все-таки метап, сделанный девочками, и я здесь не могу участвовать. Я вот выскочил на сцену, даже я не на сцене уже. Вот. Вы можете угощаться э, да, вот этим, и э, у нас есть чай, кофе, а чай, кофе там, если вдруг вы не знаете. Вот. У нас сегодня будет... Ну, и Марина все... Ой, Настя, Настя, у нас сейчас будет прямое включение из Лос-Анджелеса. Одна девочка, которая будет рассказывать нам про крутые штуки, которые она делает. Потом будет секретный доклад от а, наших друзей из LAJS. Это такое же комьюнити, которое делается в Лос-Анджелесе. И третьим докладом будет выступать у нас Настя. Она сегодня у нас ведущая и также презентация и спикер. Да. Вот, поэтому слово Настя и я... А еще... Обязательно сейчас пишите всем своим друзьям в Facebook и по скайпу, чтобы они присоединялись к нам. Потому что у нас есть бесплатная книга. Просто хорошая, хорошая интернет-идея с вечером. Да. Да, на самом деле Егор уже, в принципе, практически все сказал. Единственное, я хочу поблагодарить всех, кто пришел, потому что суббота вечер, и вы нашли время, силы и желание присоединиться сегодня к нам, к нашему метапу. Это на самом деле здорово и дорогого стоит. Поэтому э, мы и так затянули немножко начало. Просим прощения за это. И дальше тянуть, наверное, нет смысла, так как все готово. Давайте начинать. Мачика у нас первая. Э, очень интересно, думаю, будет послушать всем ее опыт участие в комьюнити, которое далеко-далеко от нас находится. Возможно, много нового мы для себя узнаем. И будем перенимать их опыт и у нас в Беларуси. Мачика? Hi, you can start. Hi. Hi. Can I start? <laughs> yep, sure. Awesome. So I didn't understand any of that. I don't speak Russian. But I just wanted to say thanks for letting me present, and I'm really excited to um, t get to talk to people from halfway around the world. Um, my name is my name is Machiko, and just to introduce myself really briefly, I used to be a journalist. I am now a OK web developer. I also teach sometimes. And I am a super lazy meetup organizer. Um, and what I mean by that is when I first moved into my new apartment on the other side of Los Angeles, there weren't that many tech meetups and I was really sad. And so I wanted to learn like, you know, I was like, how can I start a meetup but put the least amount of work in it and still make it really awesome? And so today I want to talk a little bit about what I've learned this year. Um, running tech meetups in LA. I run one called Map Time LA, um, and there are map times all over the world. I know there are some map times in Europe. I don't think there are any on that side of Europe yet, but um, I run that one. I run um, uh, an event called Rails Girls, which I know is also international, and my friend and I have another one where we just do pair programming called the Perry Meetup. And um, it's been really fun this year learning from how to organize so many events with basically no money and no corporate sponsors. So this is just a little bit of what I've learned. Um, so this is a 30-second lesson in American psychology. The other day I was listening to a meetup that uh, I was listening to a podcast episode about how Like America is the only country in the world where psychology is one of the most popular majors because Americans love talking about themselves and they like learning about themselves. And there's this one um, American psychologist named Abram Maslow who came up with something that he calls um, the, the hierarchy of needs in 1943. And you may have heard of it and a lot of people joke around about it, but it basically tries to understand why people do things. I want to understand why do people come to meetups. And um, according to Maslow, he believed that, you know, there was kind of like a, an order in which you would have your needs met. It starts with like your, your physiological, so like having food and shelter, and then after that, feeling safety. And then after that, only after you've had those two met, can you go up to the higher levels of like feeling like you belong and feeling it, like you have self-respect and things like that. 
And so I wanted to present my what what I've learned to be the the theory of human motivation behind meetups. And um, that's why there's Wi-Fi at the really bottom because we can't do anything without Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, and so here it is really fast. I want to go super fast to like respect your time and stuff. Oh wait, no, oh, wrong direction. Um, so um, one of the great things I've learned is that just by putting out something on meetup.com or putting up a Facebook invite and making it look really cool, you will be really surprised how many people will actually show up. <laughs> Half of the battle with meetups is actually doing it. Um, and so your basic needs are just having, making sure that you are all online where everybody else in your community is, whether that's meetup.com, Facebook, Twitter, GitHub, Slack, wherever you want to be where they are. Um, and then in real life, you want to make sure you have a regular space and time. I found that just by having a meetup at the same place and the same time, every two weeks or every week or whatever you can handle, that's the way you can get more people to come regularly. Um, and then obviously having Wi-Fi outlets, desks, water, and food. Um, one of my meetups, for example, we don't even have enough money or sponsorship to have food, but we're like next to a sandwich shop and we're next to a coffee shop, so it works fine. So just bring in their food. Um, and for us, making it free was really important because we wanted the we wanted the meetup to be as accessible as possible. People are already spending their time and money to get there, um, so that's kind of the base. Um, the next thing we learned is that. Um, Especially in a tech meetup where you want people to learn, you can't really have people learn unless they feel really safe. So some of the things we do is we make like a create a safe space and time for other people to, for everybody to introduce each other and learn each learn about each other and also learn about kind of the rules of our meetup. Um, another thing that's good to have is if you have people who are really shy about talking to you in person, it's good to have like a non non-human like way of communication because sometimes if they want to bring concerns up to you, they can do it over email or Slack instead and that's been really good. Um, number three is like the biggest thing we talk about and making sure that we have activities that all people can do of all levels. And so sometimes at our meetups we've had people that like don't even have laptops, but we've made it so that they can still um, and get ready to handle trouble. That makes it sound really scary, but sometimes at our meetups, we have these people that we almost have to ask them to leave or to just stop harassing other people there. Um, and so just mentally preparing yourself to do that, I think, is really good. Um, and I know you're thinking that that's already so much work, and you're the only organizer, and I don't know how I can do all of that. And I totally felt like that halfway throughout the year because I was so stressed out and so worried about everybody feeling kind of safe and in a good place at my meeting. And what I've discovered is that, um, and this part gets kind of funky, but if you, if you get people that come to your meetup regularly or even kind of regularly and you can um, like get to know them and trust them and give them more responsibilities, so um, a lot of people at my meetup come up to me privately and they ask me, you know, I really like this meetup. How can I, how can I get more involved? I don't know anything about coding, but I still want to help out. And so I intentionally create a list of tasks that people can do, anyone can do. That's anything from like, oh, help us, help us put the signs up, help us, you know, um, set up the chairs, or just I sometimes just people. The best way you can help is just by literally introducing yourself to everybody else that's there telling them where the bathroom is, telling them where the parking is. Um, and um, that slowly builds up to people helping each other with coding stuff, like mentoring each other. And so what I realized is as I give more responsibility to Ray and give those responsibilities to other people, it actually makes people in my meetup happier. There's less work for me, more people interacting, more people learning, and happier people that feel like they belong and they'll show up more. Um, and um, that's been... Um, kind of scary on the one hand if you're a perfectionist and you like to do everything yourself and make sure everything's going well, but it's also really liberating because you as a meetup organizer can focus on, you know, getting better speakers and, and doing better curriculum and things like that. Um, and so 
I just had some other tips that I've learned. I've learned throughout the year that's helped me a lot. And I've learned from other conferences, attending other code retreats and things like that. Um, one of the things I really like is that at our meetups, we always do a stand up at the beginning. Stand up is kind of like what we do. Um, you might do at work in an agile work environment where everybody stands up and says, says what they're working on, where they came from, and what they're stuck on. Um, we do that every single time, and it gives people a place to like learn learn about each other. Um, and the last thing we do is at the end of the night, we do a retro where everyone stands up all together again and then says like one minute or maybe even 30 seconds about what they learned that night or what they got stuck on. And that kind of helps us keep the conversation going for next time. Um, other things like for our map time meetup, we get a bunch of hackathons together, which is really fun. And then we actually end up winning, winning money. And then we use that money to like fund our meetup. So it's like a self fulfilling cycle. Um, and then when you, meet, when you meet people at, at hackathons and when you show them what you can do at the hackathons, that just brings more people to your meetup too because they're like, oh, I want to be on their team. They look like they're having fun and they win all the awards. <laughs> um, some of the things that you don't want to do is have, um, at least for us, sometimes we're too ambitious with our meetup projects and we plan all these things that not everybody can do and that just that just kind of turns people away. So having keep keeping your projects really small and minimal, like thinking very like a minimum viable product is really good. Um, and don't get burnt out from organizing. So one of the meetups that I'm part of, Map Time, they have this very strict rule that an organizer is only allowed to be the lead lead organizer for six months. You have to turn it over at that time. And I. I used to think that was a weird rule, but I think it's actually really good because it forces the organizers to constantly think about who can take over next time and kind of out like showing their process to everyone instead of and doing it in the open rather than keeping it closed. Um, so yeah, um, and yeah, so that's the goal, right? Being like a self-actualized meetup, and what I mean by that is. I mean, up where everyone's having really fun and you don't have to worry too much about people not showing up. Um, and that's it, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to be posting, I've written some blog posts about um, other like meetup like tips and stuff or like tips for like going to hackathons or like getting new people involved in projects or like teaching people how to collaborate on projects on GitHub and things like that. And I'll make sure to put those, like send those all to Marina or like put them on GitHub so you can find it. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. Okay, thank, thank you very you much. Lot. It was okay. great. <laughs> okay, thank you Machiko. Guys, are you still here? Yeah, do you hear us? Yeah. You can maybe somebody oh. have more questions about Um, about your presentation. Ребята, у кого-нибудь есть вопросы, которые вы хотите задать Мачико? Meetups are always about um, connections, networking, or also about uh, learning, uh, coding, programming, etc. Different technologies. Yeah, I've I've realized that it's it's really both because sometimes when you when you only have events that are about just meeting people and hanging out, a lot of people don't come um, regularly. But um, at my meetups, I always always make sure that we're, we're coding or learning. And I, I found that that's what keeps people coming. It's like a mix of like coding and learning and doing that with other people. So, um, yeah. Thank you. It's a, it's both. Mm -hmm. More questions? Okay, еще вопросы, может, у кого-нибудь есть? Герман, у тебя есть вопросы? Actually, I have one. Um, Achika, how big is your community and um, how many attendees do you have in general on your meetups? Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Could someone repeat that question? Um, I'm asking uh, how big is your community and how many attendees do you usually have on your meetups? Uh, 
Восьма Симс, like she doesn't hear me. All right. <laughs> um, давайте тогда к следующему спикеру. Uh, следующий у нас секретный доклад, который не был анонсирован изначально. Uh, у нас также присутствует Джейкоб, который тоже uh, наш гость из Лос-Анджелеса. Вот, он, uh, я думаю, сам представит свой доклад и расскажет, про что он будет uh, рассказывать. Джейкоб, uh, your turn now. All right, cool. Hi. Let me... All right, can you guys see that? Not yet. Yeah, we can see. Okay. All right. I don't know how to do the video thing as well. All right, I'm just gonna start. Um, so, uh, hello, my name is Jacob. Uh, I'm from Los Angeles as well. Um, I run a... Uh, a meetup out here is what uh, in the Los Angeles area um, that's all about JavaScript. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, SVGs. Um, my title of the talk is uh, Such Vector Goodness on the Web. Um, so like I said, my name is Jacob. I work at a company called Radpad. I don't think we, uh, we just cover like California and Chicago areas, but we do like rental listings and stuff. Um, it's actually a really cool place to work, and then, like I said, I was, uh, I'm an organizer of JSLA, as well as uh, I'm JCBLW all across the web, or at least in the places that matter, um, Twitter and GitHub and whatnot. Um, and actually, I, I, I love SVGs. Like, I really, really, really like them, um, and I have some proof here, and if I go to my GitHub profile page and filtered by SVGs. I have like a ton of open source projects. Some of these are in here, forks and whatnot, but I just, I just love SVGs. Um, so an SVG is a uh, scalable vector graphic. Uh, it's like a, it's just essentially like XML, uh, which is just what HTML is in a sense. Um, and you can actually embed it inside of like, uh, you can embed it inside of like image tags, or you can actually like put it directly in HTML. So it's kind of like almost like part of HTML, which is which is really great because like we usually draw a bunch of squares with HTML, and this allows us to do a lot more. It's actually uh, supported really really well. Um, so all the way down to IE9, IE8, it's I mean, it doesn't work, but like you probably shouldn't be coding for uh, IE8 anymore. Um, and yeah, there's like I have I'll post these slides later, but like I have a can I use tables, and there, it's like really really good support for for all of this stuff. So there's no reason that you really shouldn't use it. Um, and uh, you should use like SVGs because like they're really lightweight. Um, I mean, it's a vector shape, so essentially you're just drawing a path. So essentially, all the data that you uh, that you're passing along is just data for those different paths. And if you have like white space or something, you're not passing those pixels. You're actually passing blank space or you're no data. Um, they're resolution independent, meaning that it doesn't matter like what resolution your screen is. Um, they should still all look crisp. Uh, animations, they're really good at animations as well as they're. I mean, they look really good with animations just because they're so crisp. Um, you can make crazy shapes with them, which is just like awesome because like people get tired of scaring at squares all the time. Um, and then there's also a ton of other little things that it can do, like filters and mask and and, and a lot more. Um, so independence from like resolution, like I don't know how many of you have like a a two x you know screen that like. You go to a website and then you look at all the icons and they're just blurry and like it totally ruins the experience um, when going to a website. When you go to the website and it's just like all these blurry icons and you don't even want to like be there. Um, what's cool about SVGs and why I've kind of like tried to integrate them into my workflow quite a bit is that SVGs don't have to deal with uh, like at two uh, at 2x assets. You might have seen these for like Apple devices. And, and actually, since there, you don't have to have 2x uh, scaled images, they're actually a lot lighter than uh, PNGs and JPEGs and stuff when you have to do the 2x images. Um, then, uh, so SVG animations, 
Now, this is a this is actually a very crazy animation, and I actually had to build some code that would generate this. And it is, I say like SVGs are lightweight. This SVG is not lightweight because there is like a ton of like animation stuff that it's doing. Um, what's actually interesting about this animation that's here is that it's actually a background image. So this is actually like a, just a SVG image that I put as a background and all of the animations are actually happening within that markup of that SVG image. Um, and this is using SVG SMIL, which is like an animation like spec, but sadly uh, Chrome 45 deprecated SMIL in favor of CSS animations. Um, and it, it really kind of sucks because like, as you can see here, I'm able to like manipulate the paths and do a bunch of crazy stuff with SVGs. Um, but you could, there, there is still ways to, to do cool animations. Um, here is, um, so usually you just have to add in CSS or like JavaScript to be able to, to get these things to, to work right. So I have here, these are actually like a GIF and like a, a movie of some of the animations I've been working on. But essentially like you're just using CSS to translate the SVGs and do cool little things. Actually, I have a live version. I'm gonna see what this looks like on my screen. But essentially, if I were to go to this, you'll see that it's a nice little animation that goes in and then let me go back. Um, yeah, and it's, I mean, I have to say these are like more practical animations than this, this one up here. This one up here is a little bit just like experimental where these ones are like, I can see these like in a web app. Well, actually they're in a web app. So these are more likely the, the animations that you're gonna wanna be doing anyways. Um, and actually just to show you an overview of like how I did this like mailbox animation because this is, this is a little bit crazier than um, just animating, you know, uh, a, a path or, or something. But like I actually just exploded and made a sprite out of uh, an SVG, which is actually really nice because like if I did need to support IE8, that animation would not work, but I would be able to use the same asset to generate the icon because I can convert all of this stuff into PNGs and then use just swap out the background image from SVG to PNG, which is actually really, really nice. Um, crazy shape. So <laughs> I had a... Uh, thing I was going to show here, actually I can probably show it from, so a lot of the times everything is squares. I mean, the web is like notorious for just being a, a bunch of blocks. But as you can see here, we have like in this small corner down at the bottom, we have like a, a chat bubble with like a little tail at the end. And actually the image will go into uh, that tail. This is not a good example just because it's black. but. Um, Having something something like that adds a little bit of like just flair to your design, as well as like it it kind of breaks the box of like oh I have everything's just a bunch of squares. You're able to uh, have these really cool designs, um, and with SVGs you can do it. And actually, I don't know if you guys have had like a a comp or like a design spec that said like hey we need to do these crazy looking bubble things and just like cringed at it because like it's like, oh, it seems so impossible. But with SVGs, it's actually uh, a lot easier. Um, and with paths, uh, with SVGs, uh, you can actually generate these things and like be able to like draw like whatever kind of path you want onto a web page. But you might be looking at this and like thinking like, this, this is just like, this is madness. Like I don't, I wouldn't know what to do with this. It seems like it would, I could, would just make a mess of it, which actually, I've, I've done. Um, this actually, this path itself is just the heart from up, up above, right here. Yeah, so it's just this is like the actual image, but it, it comes out to this crazy looking path. Um, and there's actually a spec to where you can like read to what actually this stuff is doing, but it is kind of daunting. Um, but what actually is really good is that you don't really have to deal with like hand coding these paths. Um, what's really cool about SVGs is that like you can export them from a majority of like your vector editing programs, uh, like Illustrator or Sketch, or there's like a, a most online editing uh, image editing programs will export it to SVG. They probably edit in SVG as well, so it's like the native uh, file type for vector editors of the web. 
Um, and that's great because then you have actually a tool to build these things that it's, you know, usually these are a little bit more design heavy than functional. So you definitely would want to build these things in something that was a little bit more of a design heavy uh, application. Um, and then, so with SVGs, it's not just like building these crazy paths or whatever. They actually have uh, filters to where like, let's say you wanted to make an Instagram style application. You could actually build a lot of the filters for this application using SVGs. Now I have this example, um, let me blow this up. But this is my avatar on Twitter, and as you can see, like I have like a, a grid of squares that is covering it, and they have different colors to it, and it's like burning into the image. I actually uh, built a application that would essentially generate an SVG, and then I rendered it to a canvas and then exported it as a PNG, so that way I can use it as my avatar for things. But SVGs were able to do this whole entire effect. Um, and they they can do actually like really cool stuff as well, because like these are just squares, like I was saying, like. Squares are kind of boring. You could actually do like, you can make like a, a hexagon or you could do like a circle with these, these different types of shapes and then burn those onto the images and whatnot. Actually, it's really cool. All right, let me see. Make sure I can get back to my slides. All right. Okay. So another really cool thing with SVGs is that you're able to do maths uh, and you're also able to do uh, clip paths. So what this means is that like you could draw something and then you can then put a path, a clip path around it that will say like only show this drawing that you gave me in a certain area. So I have this example here. This is actually a, uh, a chart, a pie chart that I built with uh, Chartist, which is just like an SVG charting library. And actually I'm using a clip path to make it go into that like gauge shape. And it actually worked really nice because I was able to take this gauge shape out of a design comp and then make the clipping path for it. So that way I didn't have to really say like, oh, I have to figure out how wide it is or whatever. I actually took the actual design and then clipped my, uh, my chart behind it. And also the little arrows in SVG too. I mean, this thing is like all SVG and it actually works really well. And I'm able to actually animate it using uh, CSS properties as well, which is really nice, especially when you have uh, people who are just like not very good at JavaScript. They want to, you know, they're really good at CSS and they want to contribute a lot and they want to make things that are interactive. You can actually just give them, you know, build these things out for them and then like run with it. And a lot of the times they can build some really cool stuff with that. Um, so SVGs are really like amazing. Like um, we, we always talk about like uh, native development, how they can like build these cool shapes and whatnot. Um, and SVGs can actually do that for the web. And it's just you know kind of like a, a a hidden thing that like you don't really think about on the web. Usually you you know are just building divs and whatnot. But SVGs are awesome. And you probably use them because they're like really amazing. Um, and thanks. Is there any questions? Okay, thank you, Jacob. No problem. Okay, let's see if somebody have questions to you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jacob. Uh, so, I love SVG. I use it always in my project because it's very useful for icons and some kind of else. Uh, but sometimes, um, if you're creating a single page application, you use SVG with relative uh, links. You need, for example, clip path, uh, filters, and others. Uh, your application crashes in different browsers. I think that uh, Chrome has defective uh, model for relative links. Uh, how do you solve this problem? Um, okay, so you're, you have a single page application and you're using SVGs inside of it, and sometimes it crashes. Is that, uh, is no, that no, the no. question? The question, for example, if you use a lot of text like uh, use tag or uh, filter tag or maybe a, a clip path tag, uh, for example, it is always crashing. It's defectively rendering it, for example. Oh. Now, uh, just, just, okay. Just, uh, just try to get it. Uh, so, for example, yeah. I have uh, some path uh, which I want to illustrate with some tool, for example. Do you know the Vibos? Uh, very beautiful tool which uh, animates your uh, path, you know. 
so if yeah. you're uh, animating the path, uh, the other clip paths that uh, that are linked through your actual path are crashes. Uh, Home don't understand uh, what to render at the moment. Yeah. So I, I think we're just talking about in general the performance of SVGs and like sometimes they crash and sometimes you know it's it's not fun. So doing like filters and like some of the more crazy uh, technical stuff that I showed off at the end, kind of like clip paths and, and filters and whatnot, aren't necessarily. I, I say these SVGs work on all browsers, but a lot of the times that's the main spec, being able to draw paths and like some of those things. But like some of the more advanced features like filters and clip paths don't work so well on older browsers. And especially if you get a very complex like filter, for instance, like that filter I showed off for the image is insane. Like I try to host it on a web server and, and run it on there. And like I try to run it on Phantom. Phantom wouldn't do it, it broke. And then I had to install Chrome on a web server and then run it on the web server on Chrome. And then actually it would, Chrome would crash like the second time I try to render it. So there are some performance issues when you try to do very crazy stuff. I think, you know, SVG has uh, a lot of power in doing some of the more simple like icons and like uh, doing simple animations. Um, when you get in some of the crazier stuff, you kind of have to target like newer browsers and like sometimes even then you can run into performance issues if you go a little, little overboard like and kind of have to just like scale so, it sorry, back what, what to something that is a little bit more reasonable. For, if you're a truly JS geek, you're always trying to create some fancy stuff. You know, stuff, you know, you know this, uh, uh, but I, I didn't get your question. Once again, please. Hey. Do we have some connection problems? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? D Jacob, do you hear me? Jacob, do you hear us? Yeah, can you say that again? Again, <laughs> uh, do you hear me? So the question is, uh, if you're trying to create yeah, yeah. some fancy product, you're always using uh, some interesting things that there are in SVG specification, for example, the filters. Uh, but you didn't get my, uh, my question. For example, if I'm trying to use a rather hard uh, architect of text with uh, some relative links in it, uh, you can't always uh, uh, support all browsers, everybody get it, but is there any cross-browser uh, solutions for this? J um, just try to surf uh, through the stack overflow, I do it uh, infinitely. Uh, yeah, so for ages, um, I couldn't something find... You could do. Sorry. Something, uh, no problem. Um, something you could do for like cross-browser support for some of these like crazier features like I would, I would say like if they're really crazy features and they depend on doing these filters, like you probably want to say like, hey, you have to have a certain browser to be able to do this. But there are ways if you were to say like, for instance, like all the icons, the animation stuff that I was showing off earlier, like if you wanted to have like support for those things in older browsers, you definitely could. It's just you would need to generate PNGs based off of those SVGs. And actually what's really cool is that there's a lot of tools out there that will help you generate PNGs from SVGs. So that way, when it is supported, you can show the SVGs, and when it's not supported, you show PNGs. But like things like the filters and like path animations definitely would not work in those older browsers. Okay, do you have any uh, GitHub profile? I'll contact with you and describe my problem. Yes. Actually, what I always have. Show me the context, please. Yeah, so. Uh, my uh, username on GitHub is JCBLW. Okay. So I have a bunch of stuff up there um, for SVGs, uh, and definitely if you uh, follow me and like open up some conversation, we can definitely talk through some of the, the, the issues that you're having. That'd be cool. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Ребята, еще вопросы у кого-нибудь? Вы можете задавать на русском, чуть что можем перевести. И да. Да, если после нашего метапа э, вдруг у кого-то появятся вопросы, 
Можете писать их в Фейсбуке, оставлять под постом в группе WebNotBombs. Все вопросы будут переданы докладчикам, и мы опубликуем ответы на все вопросы. Окей, okay, thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Так, сейчас... Uh, hi, guys. Uh, you know, на Егор можно я скажу пару слов? Это Марина. Конечно, Марина. Давай. Отлично. <laughs> ура, ура. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for Jacob and for Machika for being there. I so appreciate you. Thank you, guys. You just, you just awesome. Uh, I want to say thank you for JSLA, uh, like the meetup, the the community. They ha helped me to do it all. I cannot do it without their help. Uh, And few words in Russian, if you don't mind, Jacob and Machika. <laughs> okay. Uh, ребята, спасибо большое, что вы пришли сюда. Я знаю, как это сложно найти время в субботу вечером и прийти на непонятный скучный метап. Uh, так случилось, что мы не могли это сделать в будний день. И я очень рада, что вы все пришли сюда и что вы с нами. Uh, я понимаю, что очень многим не получилось прийти, поэтому до сих пор есть группа в Фейсбуке, вы можете писать вопросы туда, я обязательно их передам и Джекоб, и Мачика, и мы с ними поговорим для вас, и все их доклады будут переведены на русский и выложены в ближайшие дни тоже, чтобы... Те, кто почему-то, по каким-то причинам не смог понять полностью все, не отставали. Uh, ну, наверное, это все. Настя, спасибо тебе лично большое за то, что ты ведешь этот доклад <laughs> в Минске. И я, на самом деле, очень грущу, что я не смогла к вам приехать в uh, вашу ужасную зиму. Вот так вот. Привет солнечного сада. Так и есть. Ну, это все от меня. Настя, спасибо, давай, жги. За, за нашу зиму. Окей, okay, сейчас, я думаю, мы прервемся на кофе-паузу. У нас есть кофе и не только кофе, как мы уже говорили. Я думаю, что минут, 5, минут 15, да, можете тут угостить.